Hello Acolytes, and welcome back to another video. So, this Christmas I went to Barnes & Noble with my partner and spent over an hour trying to choose a book to be my Christmas present. I carried around a few thrillers, a few mystery novels, but I was struggling to choose. My boyfriend suggested a book that he saw on the shelf thinking that it seemed like something I would be interested in, and it was a relatively new release. It seemed like an interesting enough story, and we decided to pick up this book and put it in my stocking. That book was She's Gone by David Bell. It's a young adult mystery thriller released in November of 2022, and it has a decent score on Goodreads at a 3.7 out of 5. I opened the book and finished it the same evening. It wasn't extraordinarily long, it was 369 pages, and I finished it in about 2 hours and 40 minutes. I have some opinions that I would like to share, and what better way to use those opinions than for content? The story follows Hunter Gifford, a 17-year-old high school senior who wakes up in the hospital on the night of homecoming. He learns that he and his long-term girlfriend, Chloe Summers, were in a serious car accident, but Hunter has no memory of it. Chloe went missing that night, but her wallet, shoes, and blood were found in the passenger seat of Hunter's car. Everyone in town thinks Hunter must have done something to Chloe, and because of his amnesia, he can't be sure that he didn't do anything to her. He's gotta find Chloe and solve the mystery of what happened that night. If that premise sounds interesting to you and you'd like to read the book for yourself, I would recommend you click off this video now, because from this point on, it's gonna be spoiler city. I'm going to guide you through the entire plot, spoilers included, so strap in. I do think one of the most interesting things about that premise is that Chloe is missing and not dead. That leaves a ton of open possibilities for what could have happened to her. I suppose we'll find out if any of those interesting possibilities come to fruition. The book opens on Hunter Gifford making a video in his bedroom. He's telling the audience that he and Chloe were supposed to go to homecoming together and they must have driven away together, but he has no memory of this happening. I do want to make special mention of this. He says that they were driving Hunter's dad's Dodge Charger. This becomes a bit of an issue in like three chapters time. But for now, just remember, he says they're driving Hunter's dad's car. They got into a severe car accident, hitting a tree. Hunter claims that the police believe somebody found him wandering around, dazed, and dropped him off at the hospital, but this person didn't show their face, appear on security footage, or give the hospital any information. Chloe is missing, but her personal items were still in the passenger seat of the car. I would also like to bring up a weird side note. <laughs> this author... <laughs> I think this author has a bit of a grudge against social media. It's brought up throughout several portions of the book, and it's often talked about with a dismissive tone. It, it just doesn't feel super realistic these days for a teen in high school, which Hunter is supposed to be, to be so dismissive of social media. It feels like maybe that was relevant 10 to 15 years ago, but now social media is so ubiquitous that even if a student didn't use it, I can't imagine them being derisive of it. The author is 53 years old, so that might be why. I just bring it up because in this chapter, Hunter thinks to himself, everybody thinks people my age just spill everything all over social media, but I'm not like that. Uh, and I cringed <laughs> a lot at that. Anyway, Hunter ends this video by making an appeal to the public, asking them to keep an eye out for Chloe and report anything they know to the police. He mentions he loves Chloe and he needs to see her okay. He posts the video to a channel for a club at his school called Ex Libris. It's a creative writing club that he and Chloe joined together. This video really does not go over well with the viewers. The comments are universally negative, accusing Hunter of killing Chloe and posting this video as a cover-up. In the next chapter, we're briefly introduced to Hunter's dad. He's a history professor at the local community college, and from his interactions with Hunter, we can conclude that he's not a very emotional man. He's very stiff and awkward. And at this point, we also learn that Hunter's mom died of breast cancer a year and a half before the start of the story. We're also introduced to Olivia, Hunter's sister. She's 15 years old, loud, and very opinionated. I also love Olivia. She's got such great energy. Olivia has seen the video that Hunter posted, and she and their dad don't agree with him posting it. They think it's a bad idea, people have been harassing the Giffords and vandalizing their home, and the dad just thinks this video is going to make it worse, that everything was settling down a little bit, but Hunter caused another- is going to cause another stir up. Back to the crime at hand, we're gonna get a big info dump here, so hang tight. We learn about the police investigation of the accident. They tested Hunter's blood on the night of the accident and found that he wasn't high and he wasn't drunk. They checked their phones and found that neither Hunter nor Chloe were texting at the time of the, tr of the crash. The police also put forth a theory that there might have been another car involved, 
either accidentally or on purpose. They took paint scrapings from the car that Hunter was in to see if they were hit, but we never hear about the results of this paint scraping test. This is where that mistake comes back in the first chapter. In the, in the first chapter with the video, Hunter says that he and Chloe were riding in Hunter's dad's car. But in this chapter and throughout the rest of the story, it's referred to as Chloe's dad's car. It's a small mistake, but I'm totally baffled that something like this was missed in the editing process, especially considering that these are less than 15 pages apart, and it is actually pretty important to the story. I will speak more on that later, so hang tight. <laughs> Continuing on, Hunter's blood was found on the steering wheel, which makes sense because he has a pretty severe concussion from the accident and memory loss. Trace amounts of Chloe's blood were found in the passenger seat. The police also think that it's unlikely that Hunter would have been able to walk by himself to the hospital five miles away in, in his condition with the concussion. So after that info dump, we're back in the present moment where Olivia thinks that making the video was a mistake. and. Though she knows that Hunter is usually awkward and nervous, she believes that other people will read it as a sign of guilt. I think at certain points, the author is trying to imply that Hunter might actually be guilty, but I personally never bought the idea that he could be. Hunter talks about Chloe in an exclusively positive way, and he doesn't really show any violent tendencies. He shows some, but not a lot, and this is an extenuating circumstance that's extraordinarily stressful. Part of the reason why I never bought from the beginning that it could be Hunter is how the people closest to him react. Olivia hasn't noticed any change in his behavior, his dad doesn't mention anything. This is just how Hunter is, and that makes me believe that he isn't guilty. I just, I just wish if the author was going to try on occasion to make Hunter seem like he could be the culprit, that he would actually go further in that direction and drop more clues that Hunter could be dangerous. I think the author attempts to do this a little bit in the next chapter. At school, Hunter discovers a rubber skeleton hanging from his locker with a piece of paper pinned to it that says Chloe Killer. Obviously, Hunter is furious about this, so he rips the skeleton off the locker, throws it to the ground, and stomps on it. This is one of a few times in the novel that suggests that Hunter has a temper and acts rashly, but there's conflicting images of this guy that's not emotional and keeps things close to the chest, like his father, and a guy that has an explosive temper, and I'm not sure they mesh well especially considering that people react to Hunter like this change, this aggressiveness is new. Like this is not what his personality previously was. Anyway, at school, Hunter is approached by a friend, Chad. Chad says he has something to tell Hunter, but he wants to talk about it later when they have more time. This is another slightly frustrating trend that shows up in the novel. Often characters with information will approach Hunter and tell him they need to speak to him, but not now. I know that this is just a way for the author to build suspense and keep the reader engaged, but it does wear thin quite quickly. There's always a reason given, like this time it's because their morning class is about to start, but it's still frustrating. And when I was reading the Goodreads reviews, this is something that did come up quite a bit in, in the reviews that were less positive. So Hunter heads to his first period class, which he shares with another student, Mike Basher. I just so happen to quite like Basher. He's a bit of a himbo and I think it's sweet. Basher used to date Chloe, and Chloe's dad liked Basher because of their shared interest in restoring cars. Even after Chloe and Basher broke up, he still goes to her house to work on cars with Chloe's dad. We also learn at this point that Chloe's family has a detached garage where Chloe's dad spends a lot of his time repairing a Mustang. Hunter also recalls a time that Basher wrote a romantic poem about a beautiful girl, and it was clearly about Chloe. Hunter convinced Chloe to go to their creative writing professor, Ron Hartman, about the poem, but nothing came of it and Chloe regretted going to speak to him. She decided she doesn't want a recommendation from this teacher anymore, and Hunter assumes it's because of this incident. In the present, though, Basher gives Hunter a thumbs up. Then, over the intercom, the principal announces that the school will be holding a candlelight vigil for Chloe. Later at lunch, Chad and Hunter go for a walk to talk about what Chad wanted to mention. Chad tells Hunter that his girlfriend, Hannah, saw Chloe crying in the bathroom on the night of homecoming. Unfortunately, Hunter already knows this information because the police question him about it. Hannah also saw Chloe in the hallway later, and she told Hannah that Hunter was extremely angry, madder than she had ever seen him before. Chloe told Hannah that she wanted to leave the dance before Hunter did anything stupid. We're back to that implication that Hunter could have done something to Chloe, but I'm still not convinced that he could have done something. 
And even if it was an accident, the way things are described and the condition that Hunter is in with his concussion makes it impossible for me to believe that Hunter did anything like bury her or hide her body without the police being able to find her extremely easily. So again, I feel from the very start of the book that my time is being wasted by the idea that Hunter is a suspect. We learn some additional information about Hunter and Chloe's relationship. One month before the homecoming dance, they were intimate together for the first time. He noticed after that that she became withdrawn and short-tempered, but he wasn't sure if it was about that or if it was just stress. Chloe's parents put a lot of pressure on her to achieve high grades and go to an Ivy League school. He does worry if she was on edge because they had planned to try and do it again on homecoming night. Sorry for the language, but I have literally no idea what you're allowed to say on YouTube without being demonetized. <laughs> Sorry. Here we also get the first mention of a journal that Chloe kept. Hunter doesn't know what's in it or where it's kept, and the police haven't been able to locate it either, but maybe it's important, so keep it in mind. Hunter believes that something in that notebook is going to lead them to where Chloe is and what happened that night. Hunter asks Chad if he thinks Basher, my poor innocent boy, could have done anything to Chloe, and Chad doubts it. Hunter then questions Chad about the validity of Hannah's story. He believes Hannah's a bit of a liar because she and Hunter used to date, but she cheated on him during summer vacation. Obviously, Chad is offended and they end their conversation. <laughs> so here we get introduced to a new character, someone filming Hunter. Immediately, Hunter goes to confront the guy and he realizes he knows him. He's another senior, Daniel, and he and Hunter used to be very close friends. Hunter asks why Daniel is filming him, but Daniel says he doesn't have time to explain, but they can talk about it at the vigil later. Yay, another later conversation, just as soon as our last later conversation finished. I only need to mention the next chapter briefly because they introduce Gabriella. She's Olivia's Hunter sister's girlfriend. She's also 15 and she's calm and mature. She's also an immigrant from Mexico. Okay, moving on. After class, Hunter goes to speak with his English teacher, the one Chloe had gone to about Basher's poem, Ron Hartman. We're told that Hartman has previously been fired from a teaching position in Colorado, supposedly because the admins at the school were stuck up. E, you might want to remember that. <laughs> keep, it in, keep it in your mind, palace. Ron isn't at school today, and he claims to be sick. We also learn that Ron is the faculty sponsor for Ex Libris, the club that Hunter and Chloe are members of. Hunter clearly admires Ron very much and considers him not just a teacher, but a friend. Later that evening, Hunter is trying to decide on whether it's appropriate for him to go to the vigil or whether skipping it will make him look guilty. Eventually, he decides to go. His friends, father, and sister are all going with him. At the vigil, we get introduced to Chloe's parents and we learn a little bit of information about them. Laura, Chloe's mother, is a little overbearing towards Chloe and puts a lot of pressure on her to achieve good grades, as well as other more personal things like her weight and her clothes, but she and Chloe are very close. Chloe is their only child, and they've tried but weren't able to have any more kids. Scott, Chloe's father, is a hands-on guy, and we've previously been made aware of his main hobby, restoring cars. They're both on stage at the vigil. Scott speaks at the vigil, saying he knows Chloe is out there and that they love her and miss her, and Laura also decides to speak, even though she is visibly more distraught than Scott. She is a little less charitable and a little more direct. She says they miss Chloe and would do anything for her, but someone in the crowd, Hunter, wouldn't do the same. She accuses Hunter of lying about his amnesia and not fully cooperating with the police. The crowd starts to turn on Hunter, yelling and throwing things at them. Laura explains that, quote unquote, he's the boyfriend, the boyfriend always knows. At this point, I'd like to go on a small tangent about true crime. In recent years, true crime has exploded in popularity. It's still huge right now, but I think it definitely peaked in like 2021. This book definitely takes elements from the true crime genre, and unfortunately, it's really likely that I missed some of these themes and references. I'm not a big true crime fan. I tend not to engage with it because it makes me very nervous, but I do believe what Laura's saying here is a theme, if that's what you would call it, in true crime. Very often, when a crime is committed against a woman, it is her boyfriend or husband that does it, overwhelmingly so. But because of this, I didn't believe it was Hunter even more. I have no idea at this point if the author is legitimately trying to get us to believe that Hunter is the perpetrator. So many pages are dedicated to the idea that it could be him, but I can't tell if we as the reader were ever supposed to think it was. I just don't know if this is intentional lampshading or just an allusion to the true crime genre. I don't know. <laughs> 
Hunter leaves the vigil to the jeers of the crowd, not having time to meet up with Daniel like he had planned. So Daniel messages him afterward and invites him over because they didn't have the opportunity to chat. Hunter goes over to Daniel's house and Daniel is home alone. Daniel's mom is a nurse that works night shift and his dad left when he was young. Daniel greets Hunter at the door and is very excited about what he wants to show Hunter. He says he's going to capture this story, Chloe's story, to use as his big break to be a filmmaker. He rambles on a bit about how true crime is really popular and this should definitely put him on the map. Hunter is angry about what Daniel is doing, justifiably, but he decides to hear him out. The documentary is cheesy and amateurish and worse for Hunter, it starts to position him as the primary suspect, enumerating the evidence and the suspicions mounting against him. Hunter gets pissed and accuses Daniel of making him look guilty, but Daniel said this is how it's done to build a story for the theatrics. Hunter refuses to watch the documentary and leaves, ending his friendship with Daniel, but Daniel resolves to keep working on the movie. I would like to emphasize that they had a verbal argument and at no point were their blows traded or anything like that. It was purely a verbal confrontation. As soon as Hunter stormed out, I was incredibly frustrated with him as a protagonist. It's completely obvious to the reader that there is legitimately going to be something important in this documentary, but Hunter won't even give Daniel the time to explain. I'm telling you right now, this is chapter 22. Hunter doesn't watch the video until chapter 39. Are you kidding? Especially considering what happens, Hunter should absolutely have watched the video sooner. Moving beyond my personal gripes, that evening, Hunter considers apologizing for blowing up at Daniel when just before midnight, Daniel sends him a message with the documentary embedded. Hunter goes to sleep and is woken up the next morning by knocking at his door. The police are there and no one knows why, but they assume it's for Chloe. The detective assigned to the case to speak to Hunter is Detective Haley, and he's sitting at their kitchen table. Hunter asks if they found something out about Chloe, and instead, the detective begins to arrest Hunter. Detective Haley stops to ask Hunter a question. Where was he last night? Hunter tells the truth. He was at Daniel's house from around 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock p.m. He tells Haley about the documentary and that they'd had an argument. The detective keeps asking if slash when Hunter hit Daniel, but we know he never did. The reader saw their whole conversation, and we have no evidence that Hunter is an unreliable narrator. After Hunter continues to deny any physical altercation, Detective Haley reveals that Daniel was murdered that night. At this point, I am screaming in my mind, watch the damn video. But of course, Hunter doesn't do that. Instead, he decides to go against the advice of literally everyone and make another video to put up on the Ex Libris YouTube channel. He says he's trying to get any leads on what happened to Daniel or Chloe, but I'm just slightly annoyed by it. If these videos came to anything or caused anything of consequence, I'd be a bit more forgiving of them. Hunter says that no one in his generation watches the news. Social media is how they receive and share information, which is very true. It's just that these videos never amount to anything in the story other than people being more suspicious of Hunter and a lot of wasted pages as people tell him that this was a bad idea. With everything going on, Hunter is temporarily pulled out of school until things settle down. When he's nervously staying alone at his house the next day, he thinks about how all the evidence points to him. He fixates on the idea that maybe his concussion caused some kind of brain damage. Maybe he's blacking out and doing these awful things, and this is so ridiculous that it actually gives me brain damage. How could this possibly be happening? We have literally accounted for every minute of Hunter's time up until the time Daniel dies. We have no indication that this is happening, no clues, no blackouts, no missing time. This is literally just the waste of most of a chapter. I hate this chapter. I'm moving on. Chad and Hannah, Hunter's school friends, come to visit him. Hannah's dad is a prominent lawyer in this town and she overheard him talking about Daniel's murder case. The person that broke into Daniel's house took all of his camera equipment and his laptop, but they left his mother's jewelry and computer alone. This definitely indicates that it wasn't just a robbery gone wrong, but a calculated attempt to kill Daniel and hide whatever he filmed. During this conversation, Hunter also confronts Hannah about what Chad said on homecoming night. He accuses her of lying or exaggerating and Hannah obviously gets offended. She says that Chloe said Hunter felt betrayed. Hannah and Chad then leave in a huff because Hunter has horribly insulted people who are trying to help him 
Great. Love that for our protagonist. At this point, Hunter's prime suspect is still Mike Basher, even though he's done literally nothing except be Chloe's ex. With everything going on, Hunter just wants to talk to a trusted friend, so he asks to meet up with Ron Hartman. They meet up in the school parking lot and chat in Ron's car. Hunter updates Ron on everything that's going on and laments the fact that he still can't remember anything. Ron presses him a little bit about his memory and mentions that even if Hunter's memories come back, they could be false or unreliable. This is relatively believable. Human memory is weird. Hunter asks Ron if he knew Daniel and Ron said he didn't. Ron presses again to see if Hunter remembers why Chloe was so upset that night and Hunter says no. At this point, I was getting major creepo vibes from Ron. I think it's pretty apparent that there's something that he doesn't want Hunter to be able to remember and it has something to do with why Chloe was crying. Hunter admits to Ron that he and Chloe had sex for the first time a month before homecoming, and it was pretty awkward. He also mentions that he broke the first rubber by accident trying to put it on, but that he doesn't think he broke the second one. I promise that this info is actually relevant, otherwise I would skip it because it's awkward to talk about. Hi mom, I know you're watching my video, sorry. <laughs> He says 10 days after he and Chloe had sex, she became distant and uninterested in physical affection. Ron said he didn't notice anything different about Chloe, but he did see Hunter and Chloe arguing outside in the parking lot on the night of homecoming, which Ron was chaperoning. Apparently, on homecoming night, Hunter furiously approached Ron and told him that they needed to talk, and he asked to meet up in the parking lot. They never talked, though, because Hunter and Chloe exited the gym arguing. They then got into the car together and drove off. Following his hunch, Hunter asks if Basher was there, but Ron didn't see him at all. Hunter leaves Ron and decides to drive along the road that he and Chloe had their accident. He sees a few deer, which will be a little notable in a second, don't let me lose you. When he pulls up to the crash site, there's another car there that he doesn't recognize. He stands by the tree they crashed into and tries really hard to remember anything from that night, and he suddenly remembers the moment of the crash, being out of control and hitting the tree. Hunter opens his eyes and he sees Chloe's dad, Scott. Now this conversation with Scott is pretty long, but there are a few notable moments. Hunter reveals that he remembered something coming at the car and hitting the driver's side, causing the car to swerve off the road and into the tree. Scott asks if it was another car, but Hunter doesn't know. He thinks it could have been a deer. Scott says he hopes he remembers more, but he seems distant. Hunter brings up Daniel and Scott becomes enraged. He's angry that Daniel was making a documentary about Chloe. Daniel had asked to interview them and was turned down several times. Then, Scott asks Hunter about Chloe's journal. Hunter tells him he has no clue where it is. Scott asks if he's ever read it, and Hunter says no. Now, I don't know about you guys, but at this point, sus bells are ringing loud and clear. I've been kind of suspicious of Scott from the first appearance, but this conversation really seems like it's fishing Hunter for information. More than that, Hunter says he would never hurt Chloe, and Scott says, I know that. He doesn't have any suspicion of Hunter at all, even though pretty much everyone else does. Scott ends the conversation by telling Hunter to let him know immediately if he remembers anything else. Sus! <laughs> Hunter heads home. He finally, finally at this point, decides to watch the video that Daniel sent him. Oh my gosh! He sees video evidence of him and Chloe fighting in the parking lot on homecoming night. Hunter notes that during the argument, they don't look angry with each other, just unhappy. He thinks Chloe is trying to convince him to leave, and Hunter points back at the school, like he wants to go back inside. They eventually get into the car and leave, and at the end of the video, another car leaves its parking lot and zips away like it's chasing Hunter and Chloe. Hunter can't make out any details on the car, but he thinks the police might be able to see more. He runs downstairs to tell his dad, but surprise, surprise, and also very convenient, Detective Haley is already at his house to ask more questions. Haley wants to ask a few more questions about Hunter and Chloe being intimate. He asks if Chloe was involved with anybody else, and Hunter is really offended at the idea. Hunter says that while the police were going through Chloe's computer, they found some Google searches about how likely it would be to get pregnant after sex with a broken condom. She also placed a phone call to a pregnancy helpline. In the book, it's referred to as a nonprofit geared towards young people who might find themselves in psychological trouble or having questions about their bodies. Haley asks Hunter if Chloe was pregnant, if he was the father, and if that's why they were arguing at the dance and if maybe Hunter decided to do something about it. 
Hunter tells the detective that Chloe felt very strongly that she wouldn't continue a pregnancy if it came to that. Haley suggests that Chloe staged an accident to run away and end the pregnancy. Hunter doesn't answer, but he brings up the car chasing them at the end of the video. Haley says he's seen it, but it doesn't prove anything, but Hunter tells Haley in detail about remembering being run off the road. Haley thinks it over for a moment and then puts forward the theory that maybe something did run them off the road, a deer. And in the panic of the crash, Hunter moved Chloe's body away from the car. Hunter refutes this, and again, I don't buy it because Hunter has had like a super severe concussion for the entirety of the story. Haley then puts forth the theory that maybe they were arguing in the car and Chloe made a grab for Hunter or the steering wheel. This chapter and the police questioning Hunter in general makes me so frustrated because again, I never believed Hunter did it, so all I get from this is the frustration towards the police department, which could be very intentional. There is a theme in respective true crime media that police are often just so intent on convicting someone who is innocent or so stupid that they destroy evidence, yada yada. I just never bought Hunter as the killer and I'm not sure I'm supposed to have thought any of Haley's theories were credible. I think I just find this so frustrating because I can't tell if the author was trying to make me feel what Hunter feels at this moment, or if I'm supposed to believe that Hunter, who again, has had a severe concussion and memory loss from the accident, somehow moved the body to a place that no one found it? Yeah, right. Haley suggests that maybe a car did run them off the road, but maybe Chloe was in on it and maybe the other person involved knew her secrets. Then he leaves. Hunter thinks if Chloe was pregnant, she might have written something down in her journal, and he believes that Ron might have it, but Ron says he's never seen it and he doesn't know where it is. Hunter excitedly tells Ron he remembered something about the crash, and Ron immediately goes super quiet. He then tells Hunter he's leaving his teaching position and going to another school in Ohio. Talk about being suspicious. My guy here seems upset about Hunter remembering stuff from crash night and he's planning on skipping town. There is something a super suspicious going on with Ron Hartman. At home, Hunter mentions to his sister Olivia that Chloe kept a journal and he laments the fact that the police couldn't even find it. Olivia thinks for a moment and asks if Chloe ever told Hunter about her secret hiding place. Olivia says that she got her hands on a joint at one point and didn't have a good place to hide it, so she gave it to Chloe who kept it safe and hidden in her secret hiding place in her bedroom. Olivia doesn't know any details about where exactly it is, just that it's in her room. Hunter also learns from Olivia that Chloe's family is having a law enforcement appreciation dinner that night, which means the Summers' house is going to be empty. I think we can all see where this is going. Hunter decides he's going to break into the Summers' house and find Chloe's journal, and Olivia comes to act as a lookout. He's a little bit nervous about breaking into their house because Scott has a gun, and don't mind me just slipping the definition of Chekhov's gun on the screen right now. I'm sure that has no relevance whatsoever, and I'm sure it'll never come back up later. Anyway, Hunter is going to climb through Chloe's window that has a broken lock. Olivia's girlfriend, Gabriella, also shows up to help keep lookout. Hunter not so gracefully climbs through Chloe's window, making a lot of noise and a bit of a mess in the process, but luckily no one notices him. So he's looking around for the journal with no luck. Then he gets a text from Olivia saying Chloe's parents are pulling up now. As a side note, how short was that dinner? There are a lot of plausible explanations, I'm sure, but damn, Hunter just got there. <laughs> He quickly cleans up everything he's knocked over and then desperately tries to open the window, but he's running out of time. Laura is arguing with Scott because she wants to sleep in Chloe's room, but Scott doesn't think it's healthy. Scott says she spends all of her time in Chloe's room and Laura shoots back that he spends all of his time in the garage, more than ever. That might be something you want to tuck away in your brain. We're just adding it to the folder you're keeping in your mind palace. Because he's out of time, Hunter hides in Chloe's closet. Laura approaches the closet, but stops short of opening the door. She asks Scott if he's fixed the hole in the plaster. She wants everything to be perfect for when Chloe comes home. He says he hasn't gotten to it yet. He tells her to leave the closet alone for now, but Laura becomes very angry with him. She yells at Scott because he wants to move away and start over, which is super sus. Why would you want to move away if you truly believe that your daughter might come home? It's pretty obvious that Scott knows something, but we're going to have to wait to figure it out. Hunter needs an opportunity to escape, and he gets it when someone rings the doorbell. Scott answers and then comes to Laura. He tells her it's a Latina girl from Chloe's school who wants to pray with them for Chloe's safe return. It's Gabriella, hell yeah. They both go to the door, and Hunter uses this opportunity to escape through the window, but first he digs around in the hole in the plaster and he finds the journal, ding ding ding. 
When Hunter makes it safely back to the car, he thanks Gabriella for her quick thinking and level-headedness. Gabriella asks the Summers, who are Catholic, to pray with her about Chloe. Gabriella mentions that Laura was sad but nice, but Scott was weird. She says, I said I hoped they found Chloe soon, and I meant it, but when I said that, her dad was all like, well, we have to prepare ourselves for the worst. This man knows something. I'm 100% convinced at this point. Hunter and Olivia head home, and he decides it's time to read the journal. At the beginning of the journal, Chloe mentions being a perfectionist, and that she might rip out pages that she doesn't think are good enough. Just a note. According to her journal, Chloe was worried that she wouldn't be able to live up to the dreams of her parents academically, and felt crushed by the weight of their expectations. Hunter also finds that when Chloe wrote about their first time, she viewed it as an overall positive experience. She said it was awkward and not really enjoyable, but she was excited to try again another time, and she isn't upset at Hunter at all. Some days later, she writes that something bad has happened and she's upset about it, but she doesn't specify what. The next page of the journal is ripped out. Is this intentional or is it just Chloe being a perfectionist? If someone else is ripping the pages out of her journal, how did it get back into her hiding spot? Her parents are looking even more suspicious. Scott, I'm coming for you. Chloe writes that she's going to tell Hunter what happens. She writes, I'm not sure who I can tell, a counselor? Should I tell my mom and dad? Hunter takes these journal entries to mean that Chloe is pregnant. Chloe writes that she's going to tell Hunter what's going on at homecoming. She says she doesn't care what the consequences are, and she knows that Hunter is going to be hurt, angry, and confused. She also mentions the next day that Basher came over and she wanted to talk to him. The next two pages of the journal are ripped out. Now, I don't know if I've made it clear that I oddly like Basher as a character. The author wants to position him as a suspect, but honestly, I don't think Basher has done anything even slightly suspicious throughout the story, even though Hunter keeps bringing him up. Like Ron, who is somewhat untrustworthy at this point, says he didn't see Basher outside on homecoming night. But luckily, for the reader, we actually have empirical proof that Basher wasn't there in the form of Daniel's video. Basher was also quite kind to Hunter on his first day back at school, giving him a nod and a thumbs up when everyone else was whispering about him suspiciously. More than that though, Basher just gives off such himbo vibes and I love a good himbo. Like he's an athlete, but he sucks. He's really bad at his sport. People are always making fun of how bad a quarterback Basher is. He seems kind of sweet though. We never really learn why Basher and Chloe broke up, but he writes a poem that sounds very sweet about her, not just describing her as beautiful, but as a queen on a throne. He clearly respected and admired her. I can see how she wouldn't have appreciated a poem like that, but I don't think it was meant to be malicious. All this to say that the only suspect Hunter has ever brought up independently is Basher because he's Chloe's ex-boyfriend, but am I legit supposed to believe that Basher had something to do with this? Because there is no evidence. So the book is wasting my time trying to make me believe that Basher is a suspect. This is the first time there's been anything linking Basher to the crime and we're on chapter 61. We're three quarters of the way through the novel and this is the only evidence we have of Basher being even tangentially related to the crime. From the entries in the journal, Hunter believes that Chloe must have had sex with Basher and become pregnant. Because he's dumb, Hunter immediately drives to confront Basher and on the way he calls Detective Haley telling him to meet up at the Basher house. Oddly enough, Detective Haley is already at the Basher residence. So they meet up and Hunter hands the journal over to Haley who is obviously suspicious about how Hunter got it because according to his previous statements, Hunter had no idea where the journal was. Hunter does not give a damn about what Haley thinks and explains his Basher theory. Haley ignores Hunter and asks if Hunter ripped out the final pages. So neither of them are really having a conversation. They're just both talking and not responding to what the other person says. Weird. Basher comes out of the house and Hunter flies into a rage and tries to attack him, but he gets tackled because obviously Mike Basher is a football player, duh. <laughs> now we do actually get some extremely crucial information at this point, so listen up. Basher says to Hunter, you think her family is all into me. Let me tell you, they haven't even talked to me. I went over there to try and work with Scott to take his mind off things, and he told me he isn't even going into the garage anymore. He acted offended, pissed really, at the idea that he or anyone else would go into the garage and work on a stupid car. Now, we readers are observant and we have great memories, so tell me the inconsistency. I'm serious. Go to the comments and type out your answer. I'll play some royalty-free Jeopardy music while I wait. Okay, you're done? Good. 
Laura said that Scott spends literally all his time in the garage. He's 1000% trying to keep Basher out of the garage for some reason. At this point, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that Chloe was in that garage and I hoped she was alive because that would be very interesting. We'll have to see. Haley tells Hunter that Basher has a super airtight alibi, multiple witnesses, text messages to back up his statement, etc. The detective is way more interested in knowing how Hunter got the journal and Hunter tells the truth. He illegally broke into the Summers' home and stole it from them. This is clearly a bad idea, but I genuinely don't know if he should have done this or not. It feels dumb, but it might have turned out a lot worse for him if he lied. <laughs> Hunter makes another video, but it's literally irrelevant and he doesn't even post it, so I'm skipping this chapter and there's nothing you can do about it. Hunter goes back to the video, to Daniel's video. It's definitely about time. Someone literally murdered Daniel for the evidence that was on that tape, so clearly something else is going on. He notices that in the last few seconds, Daniel aims the camera at the ground, seemingly intentionally, but Hunter doesn't know what he's trying to show. He thinks he might get more insight looking through Daniel's other files, so he heads to Daniel's house. There, he meets up with Daniel's mom, Elizabeth. She's very kind to Hunter, and she doesn't believe that he killed Daniel at all. He asks to look through any files that Daniel has backed up on his computer, and Elizabeth agrees, but he looks for hours and finds nothing. He asks Elizabeth if she knew anything about the movie, and she mentions that Daniel was getting a lot of help from the creative writing professor. Wait. The creative writing professor? You mean hecking Ron Hartman? Ron Hartman who said he had never met Daniel? I knew this dude was sus from the moment we met him and now he's been caught in a lie. Time to confront his old balding ass. But Hunter also notices an additional piece of evidence from the video. He notices where Daniel was standing, next to where the faculty park their cars. Hunter realizes that Daniel wasn't trying to show something on the ground, but the lack of something, a car that is supposed to be parked in that spot. Guess who? Do we know a member of the faculty that's a heckin' creep? Yes. So Hunter goes to the school to confront Hart, and we're finally about to get some answers, so hold on tight. I'll give you all the info you need and then my opinions at the end. Hunter asks if Ron drove to the dance. Ron confirms, parked in his same spot. Hunter asks if he was with Daniel and Ron denies it, but Hunter calls him out. Ron says he simply misremembered, but Hunter stops him by saying the movie Daniel made was rock solid proof. Hunter mentions that Ron said he went back to chaperoning when Hunter and Chloe left, but he really pulled out of his parking spot to follow them. Hunter asks a battery of questions about Chloe being pregnant or cheating on him, but Ron just says that what went on between Ron and Chloe was more complicated than that. Ron says that he and Chloe connected in a deep intellectual and spiritual way. Hunter understands what Ron is saying and accuses him of touching Chloe inappropriately. Ron says no. Ron, the huge creepo, says, I'm so tired of this. Everywhere I go, this narrow conventional morality derails things. They don't understand it at universities or high schools. Um, ew? I'm assuming the narrow conventional morality is don't mess around with underage girls who you are in a position of power over? Also, he says everywhere I go, so I'm gonna need you to cast your mind back to the very beginning of this review where I said Ron was fired from a school in Colorado. Uh, yeah, gross, terrible, bad. Ron claims that he didn't do anything wrong. He says he behaved inappropriately with Chloe, but he didn't have any romantic or physical involvement with her. He said although Chloe made it clear she didn't want a relationship, he pursued her. He said he wasn't harassing her. Instead, they had a quote, intellectual connection that I want to pursue further. Ew. <laughs> The night of homecoming, Ron tried to kiss Chloe. At that point, Chloe decided she had to tell Hunter. She told Hunter and he became furious at Ron. Hunter wanted to confront Ron immediately, but Chloe didn't want that. And that's what they were arguing about in the parking lot that night. Ron didn't know Hunter wouldn't remember, which is why he was sick the day that Hunter came back to school. That's why he kept asking if Hunter's memory was coming back. Hunter accuses Ron of using them and not caring, but Ron becomes really angry and says he definitely cares about both of them. He says he found Hunter wandering around after the accident and took him to the hospital. Hunter asks if Ron was the one to run them off the road and Ron says no. He did follow them that night, but he wasn't the one who caused the crash and he didn't kill Daniel. Hunter says he's going to call the police, but Ron tells him to wait and listen. Ron says he followed them to try and contain the fallout from the situation. He never got to speak to them because another car came speeding up behind him. Ron thought they were going to run him off the road, but the car passed him. 
Ron pulled over because he was scared and he decided he was going to let things fall where they would. He turned to leave but got worried about the car speeding past and turned again to find Hunter and Chloe. That's when he saw Hunter, confused and concussed, wandering down the road. Obviously, Ron didn't want to be seen, so he just dropped Hunter off in the parking lot of the hospital and bailed back to the homecoming dance so no one would notice him missing. Hunter calls the police and gets out of his car. Okay, did you survive that literally massive info dump? It was so much. I really don't like how this whole reveal was handled. For basically five full chapters, Hunter and Ron just sit in a car and talk. It's a massive tell don't show. It's kind of boring. I get that's how you have to do some reveals and mystery stories, but I couldn't help imagining how it would look in a movie. It's just like three to five minutes of straight monologue. Maybe I'm being picky, but I feel like this takes a lot of agency away from Hunter. He didn't put together any clues to pull this conclusion. It's like Hunter just put together the corner pieces of the puzzle and then Ron literally dropped the completed puzzle in his lap. It wasn't very satisfying, but it was a very effective way to show Ron as the absolute giga creep he was. The way he talked about Chloe was literally disgusting. I'm disgusted. Crusty. I'm sorry for yelling. I'm passionate. <laughs> Ron isn't arrested because what he was doing wasn't illegal. Absolute blech. I'm gonna throw up. But he was fired. Now for something very confusing. Hunter's dad suggests that the reason that Chloe called the hotline was to talk about Ron and how to handle it. Upon a reread, the hotline that's mentioned is used for more than just pregnancy crisis, but it's introduced as a pregnancy hotline. So that whole red herring feels incredibly misleading. It just annoyed me. But again, I'm really petty, so... <laughs> Hunter's dad also says that Ron's testimony confirms that there was another car, so that's 100% confirmed that another car ran them off the road. Also, on the note of the whole car running them off the road thing, remember when I said the police took paint chip samples? Why did that never matter? Why did Hunter need to find all of this evidence of another car if the police should have known using the paint chip samples? Why would you have even brought that up if you're not going to use it? It wouldn't bother me if you didn't bring it up. I wouldn't have known that that's something that happens. But now that you've brought it up, where are they? What happened to them? What happened? Finally, in a conversation with Olivia, Hunter realizes the car contradiction that we remembered earlier and he rushes over to Basher's house. Hunter confirms that the contradiction exists. Then Hunter asks if the Mustang in the garage runs and Basher says yes. So that could have been the car that drove them off the road. Hunter says that the cops never really searched the garage because Chloe never went in there. That seems pretty unlikely to me, but I don't know how that works. Maybe cops really are that stupid. I have no idea. Hunter needs Basher to give him the code to the garage so they can check out the car for damage, and Basher agrees to come with, I love him, I want to smooch him on his little mouth. They sneak into the garage using the code that Basher knows. They closely examine the passenger side of the Mustang, which would have collided with the car, but they find nothing. Hunter doesn't want to give up, but they're interrupted when someone opens the garage door and turns on the light. Jump scare, it's Laura, Chloe's mom. She wants to know what they're doing here, and Hunter tells her the honest truth. Hunter questions her about whether Scott found Chloe's journal when he went to fix the plaster hole in the wall, because we do still have the missing pages to account for. He suggests maybe Scott found out Chloe was pregnant, but Laura denies that Chloe was pregnant at all. The other theory that Hunter puts forth is that Scott saw the journal and figured out that Chloe was being sexually harassed by Ron and decided to take matters into his own hands. Laura says he'd have the right to go after any guy that was sexually harassing Chloe, and I agree. Literally beat the heck out of Ron. Basher, my darling, puts the pieces together and says Scott probably didn't know what Hartman's car looked like and assumed it was the car that Hunter and Chloe were in, but that's stupid. Hunter and Chloe were driving Scott's car. The author explains it by saying that Scott must have thought that Chloe and Ron got into the car and drove off together, but that makes no sense either. Even if it was Ron and Chloe in the car, why the hell would Scott have driven the car off the road? That's still super dangerous for Chloe. I just think Scott must have been a primo dumbass for thinking that Chloe was in the car alone with her abuser rather than her boyfriend who she went to the dance with. I just, this whole reveal is driving me crazy, so I need to move on before my head explodes. Hunter turns around to see Laura pointing a big, fat Chekhov's gun at him. Remember that from earlier? Good times. Laura asks if they share this theory with anyone, and Basher swears they won't say anything. Hunter asks if Laura was the one driving the car and she says no, but Scott did what he did for her. Laura says that Scott didn't tell her the truth right away to protect her, but Scott told her what happened right after Hartman had been arrested. He thought Hartman would identify the car and expose them. 
Laura says she almost called the police, but she forgives Scott and it was an accident. She says he had to live with what he did for Chloe for the rest of his life. Causing her death was an accident. And he also has to live with what he did to that boy who made the movie. So at this point, Chloe is confirmed dead. And I will give you my thoughts on this in just a minute. She says Scott killed Daniel because if Hartman was exposed in Daniel's movie, it would identify Scott. Hunter asks where Chloe's body is. And Laura looks at a large freezer in the corner of the garage and says that they'll take Chloe with them and start over somewhere far away. Basher, my hero, quickly grabs a gas canister from the floor and throws it at Laura and in the chaos she fires the gun. Everybody hits the deck and the gun slides underneath the car. Hunter and Laura grapple viciously for the gun, but Scott shows up in the doorway and stops them, begging Laura to just let it all end. My poor angel, Mike Basher, has been shot in the right bicep, and Hunter wraps his jacket around the wound as a makeshift tourniquet. Scott tries to convince Hunter to just let them go, but Laura says she's tired and wants this all to stop. In the distance, they hear sirens. Someone must have reported the gunshot, and now the police are coming. Hunter, against the advice of Scott, approaches the freezer in the corner of the garage and lifts the lid. Chloe's body is in the freezer, still in her prom dress, bloodstained and frozen. So... I'm pretty disappointed that Chloe ended up being dead. One of the things I found most intriguing about the book was that Chloe was missing. I feel like it opened up a lot of really interesting possibilities. Was she kidnapped? Did she run away? Did she have something to do with it? Did she have secrets? Was she lying? But no, Chloe was essentially a perfect angel and then she was killed by accident. That's literally the most basic answer to what could have happened to her. And what's more than that, Throughout the story, we get Hunter worrying about whether Chloe was really the person he knew she was. But she was. She was perfect. She was loyal, kind, and smart. I don't think we ever got introduced to a flaw she had. She put a little bit too much stock into what people thought of her, but that never leads to any conflicts or clues. I don't feel anything about Chloe being dead because as a character, she was boring. She was just a victim. If you changed literally everything about Chloe's character, she might have ended up in the same exact scenario at the end of the story. It just feels like a major lost opportunity. At the end of the story, Hunter makes one more video thanking everyone for caring, but did they care? Literally posting the videos did nothing. Nobody ticked him off. Nobody gave him any information. It never came to anything. So Scott is going to prison for a long time. Ron is not allowed to teach in this district anymore, but he is allowed to teach somewhere else. Ew, gross. Why is this man not in federal prison? Ugh, but he might get charged with obstruction of justice, so that's good. As far as conclusions go, fine, it's whatever. So now we get to my conclusion, and boy, I sure do have some opinions. I don't know if you can tell, but I don't think this book is very good. I think there's a ton of wasted space throughout the story for no reason. I think the author tries to prop up certain characters as suspects, but they're totally unbelievable. Hunter, Basher. If you've ever read a mystery book before, you'll solve this one by chapter 10. I can give it a little slack in this arena because it is actually a young adult book, but that genre name is so misleading. I am a young adult. I'm 22. But young adult feels like it's literally written for 8th graders. That's a separate personal gripe though. About other things, I was also tentatively on board with Hunter's amnesia, but by the end I felt really unsatisfied with its utilization. Amnesia in the media has a bad rep these days as being a really lazy cop-out. But I was cautiously on board. Hunter has a really severe concussion, so it's a believable enough reason that he would have amnesia in the first place. Unfortunately, nothing really interesting happens with it. He only has his memories triggered once. It mostly just acts as a barrier for the Ron reveal. I'm not sure how it could have been made better. I just think this use of amnesia is one where people might roll their eyes. The other major beef I have with this book is that there are very few opportunities for the reader to use evidence to solve the mystery. For example, in Daniel's video, he's trying to show the area where the faculty park and that Hartman's car is missing, but it's literally impossible for the reader to have known that. We aren't given the opportunity to discover that Hartman was the one driving after them using that piece of evidence, and this wouldn't be a hard thing to change. Hunter already goes to talk to Ron in the parking lot, so maybe make it so that Ron is parked under a, a noticeable tree or a specific lamp post, or maybe there's a, a skid mark in a specific shape. Tell us something so that we were able to solve this mystery using the video, but we're not. It's just knowledge that Hunter has because he's a character that lives in this world and we're not characters that live in this world. The closest we get to an area where the reader can solve the mystery is conflicting testimony. Often people will say things that turn out to not be true, which is a fine enough way to give the reader some agency in solving the story. It's just this is the only way that they are giving the reader the opportunity to solve the story. 
It's the same with the car in the garage. I mentioned the paint chip samples earlier, but that's not how we found out about the Mustang. And Hunter's hunch isn't even confirmed after looking at the car. Like the car's not banged up, it's not scratched up, it's not dented. Laura just tells him what happened. Or what about the missing pages of the journal? We don't find them. Ron just tells him what would have been on the journal pages. We also dedicated so much time to trying to find the journal, but there was no useful information in it about what actually happened. It just said that it didn't have to do with Hunter and Chloe having sex, which is fine, I guess, but how is that supposed to help us solve the crime? I think the only real clues we get to the mystery are inconsistencies in the dialogue. That can work, I'm not saying it couldn't. It just makes the book feel very telling instead of showing. At the end of the story, I tried to think back on any piece of physical evidence that helped solve the crime, and literally the only thing I could think of was Chloe's body, which was found on page 364 of 369. The novel itself was fine, it was written okay, the characters were fine, I just don't think it was a very good mystery. The final word I would use to sum up She's Gone is predictable. I had suspicions of Scott from his first appearance and I was never going to be convinced by any of the red herrings. If you still want to read She's Gone, give it a go. It's not a terrible way to spend two and a half hours, but after this review, I am never going to pick it up again. Four out of ten. Thanks so much for watching this long, long video. If you'd like to see more book reviews from me, please let me know. If you have any recommendations, please leave them for me in the comments below. If you like this video, please leave me a like and follow me on all my social media to keep updated on what I'm working on next. I'm After Plague on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitch, and I'm After underscore Plague on Twitter. Thank you again so much for watching, and I hope you survive this post-plague world.